So we talk a lot about how good God is. I don't know if you caught that theme. And I think it's really appropriate to address this real quick. I, I haven't had these conversations with anybody here, but I've been in settings over the last two weeks where, where well-meaning Christians are praying about the catastrophes that have happened in our country over the last couple of weeks that have actually affected people in this room, Florida and the Carolinas. And again, well-meaning Christians will say this phrase, and I've heard it in prayers all week. They'll say, yeah, oh, God's in control. My, my friends, I, I don't know if you know this, that, that phrase actually didn't become popular until the late 70s. We're talking less than 50 years people really started to believe this idea that, that God is in control. And if you believe that God is in control, then you have to believe that God is like, well, screw Florida and the Carolinas this week. That, that's not the God that we serve. God, God is sovereign, but he's not in control. He's not, he's not bringing catastrophes. And we know this because when Jesus was walking on the earth, he actually rebukes storms. And if Jesus is rebuking the storms that God sends, then they are a house that's divided. And, and, and the Trinity reveals union, and the Trinity reveals our union. You're included in union. That means that when we can sing praises about God's love and his goodness, we can actually mean it and come to him from a place of, hey, I know that you're sovereign, but I know you're not in control of the devastation that our country is experiencing in these moments, that these, these fears that we all experience in, the, in, in our lives, the things that happen where we don't know why they happen. Sometimes it's just life, but sometimes you get around some Christians and they're well-meaning, but they don't know what to say, so they just say stupid things like God's in control when he's not at least in the way that we've understood that. So we can come to a place here, we can actually recognize that God's love doesn't come in pieces. He's not hiding himself from you. He's not sending stuff in your life so that you will trust him. That's called abuse. <laughs> Serve a good God who's for you, It's always been for you. Again, we can't always control what happens to us, but we can't control how we respond to what happens to us. And so that's the challenge. So Father, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you're full of grace. We thank you that you've given us dominion of the earth and us power to bring change into our own areas of influence. We thank you for empowering us this morning. And we love you because you first loved us. And it's in this love we say, I do. Come on, I, I, I messed it up on you just to see if you were paying attention. Some of y'all weren't paying attention. You were thinking I was going to say amen, but I said I do. I've done weddings this week. I'm doing weddings this coming up week, and I'm all about I do. <laughs> y'all may be seated. Can we give it up for our worship team? Aren't they so amazing? Man, I love our worship team. We have some of the best on the planet, don't we? Uh, yeah, so if I just dropped a bomb theologically on that whole God is in control thing, we actually did an, a podcast episode where we unpacked that scripturally because you actually don't find that in the Bible just three episodes ago. So you can find our podcast and listen to that in depth and be challenged. Cool? Okay, hopefully you're not going to turn uh, your ears off from hearing me if I just disrupted everything you believe about God. We good? Okay, I'm going to preach real quick this morning because uh, we've been in the sermon series called Honor, and uh, we've been in it a lot haven't we? We've been talking about all month of September. We talk about it all month of October because I think it's so important for us to not only be aware of honor, but to practice honor. I mean, we, we can talk about controversial topics all day long. We got people in this church that are like, why don't we talk about this? And I'm like, well, do you struggle with that? And they're like, no. So I'm like, well, why would we talk about that? Do you struggle with honor? Because I do. So let's talk about it. <laughs> Because it's so easy to not honor the people that we disagree with and the people that we look down on and the people that do things we wouldn't. Don't leave me alone up here. Man, I, I, I struggle with what I'm going to talk about today, okay? And I know I've said that in the last three weeks. I struggle with honor, y'all. Don't leave me alone. Come on. I struggle with honor. We're, we're in political season. I struggle with honor. Okay, I'll move on. <laughs> Guys, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on, they don't care about you. Okay, just, okay, okay, just, why don't you tell people how, who, who to vote and how to vote? No, I'll, I'll never be that type of a pastor. I'll never, I'll never tell you who to vote. Vote for your convictions. 
but, but recognize that everybody's at the table. Okay, we're actually gonna do a sermon series in November called uh, Saved You a Seat, and I think it's timely. I think it's timely. Uh, God never intended to change the world through voting booths and war. He always challenged us to change the world through having conversation at a shared table. And, and, and you can't, you can't be at a shared table on Facebook. Okay, that's all I'm going to do. All right, you ready? Honor. Can, can we honor people at their worst moments? So easy to preach, so hard to live. Okay, so I'm in this with you, all right? I'm going to chew on what I'm going to speak today as much as you're going to chew on it, okay? I've been chewing on it all week, struggling. I'm struggling with this one. But we, we've been talking about characters in the Bible where could we have honored these characters if we met these people during their weakest and worst moments? And, and I got to be honest, we say this and we're like, yeah, we would. No, we wouldn't. No, we, no, we would not. No, we, I think it's unfair that, that we have the Bible as we have it in its entirety. Because we're going to look at Peter today, and, and I'm just going to tell you, I think it's so easy to talk about Peter and how we would honor him today even in his worst moments, because, because we know that he came back. Do, do you know how easy it is to preach about his weaknesses that we're going to talk about here in a second and be like, we should honor him. But we know the dude got crucified upside down following Jesus. We, we know he came back. And, and I got thinking in the shower this morning, weird, weird, but that's where I get my best thoughts. Just pause there for a minute. Um, I, got, I got to thinking like, would we be talking about Peter in the same light if he didn't come back? Would we be talking about Peter in the same light if the last part of Peter was his denial? Something to think about. We've talked about Rahab, the prostitute, juicy stuff. We talked about Joshua. That was funny. The biggest prankster in the Bible. We talked about David, a man after God's own heart, doing some foolish acts. We talked about Nathan and his confrontation. We talked about Zacchaeus. Didn't Pastor Tish do great last week? Don't we have an amazing children's pastor? Some of y'all are giving a golf clap for somebody who's raising your kids, just so you're saying. That's a shot at me, because she's doing a better job raising our kids than we are. Than I am. I won't put you in that boat, baby. Than I am. Good answer. Good answer. What are we on the prices right? No, that's a family feud. Good answer. Good answer. Uh, this is my only verse I'm going to really focus on today. John 2, Throw it up there for me. Uh, we give the disciples... Man, we make fun of the disciples. We praise the disciples. This is what I've been chewing on. After Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said then. Say then. Then. Okay. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. I I've been thinking about this, this passage for like years, y'all. We're going to hold that up there. After he was raised from the dead, then the disciples believed. So don't get it twisted. When we read the stories in the Gospels of the disciples who followed Jesus and they had high moments of faith and low moments of faith, they were lying the whole time, y'all. Just like some of us. Because they didn't actually believe that Jesus was the Messiah until when? After the resurrection. Okay, that is some context that we need to give these dudes the benefit of the doubt, okay? Because I'm about to rip apart Peter. Peter didn't believe until when? After, after these fools saw Jesus raise people from the dead, turn water into wine, which is uh, one of my, uh, John Crowder, he says this. Uh, he says Jesus' first miracle was uh, turning water into wine because he knew that everybody needed a stiff drink before he obliterated everything they believed about God. <laughs> I love that thought. If you're offended by that thought, um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes the God that we think that we believe in the Bible isn't who he actually is because Jesus came not to judge, <laughs> he came, came to save. And did he do a good job or not? That's up for you to decide. Uh, Jesus believed in these fools. And I say fools because I, I'm, I'm putting myself in with the fools. Uh, he believed in them even though he knew that they wouldn't believe until after. Does that not challenge how you honor people? 
It challenges how I honor people. Like, can, can, I, can I believe in people before they ever change their behavior? Can, can I believe in people and honor people whether or not they ever change their behavior? Man, that is, that is something to chew on, isn't it? I'm glad that you're with me this morning. That's, that's hard to do. So the disciples did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. That, that gives so much grace to these dudes. Let's highlight Peter. Can we highlight Peter? Can we highlight Peter? Can we? Okay, real quick. We ready? So Peter has uh, humanity. You know what I mean by that? He was a real human being with real feelings and emotions. Uh, the scripture says that that dude had a mouth on him, which praise Jesus. I love me some Peter. I oftentimes justify my own self because of Peter. I'm glad some of y'all are laughing. Those are the people, my homies. You do it too. The others of you are lying. Because you don't believe that it's wrong as long as you just thought it and didn't say it. There's no shame in this place. <laughs> Only grace. Okay, Peter's humanity. Let's highlight some of his humanity, right? He's a real dude that had feelings and experiences, lived experiences, right? We're talking about how to honor the human in their lived experiences. Uh, we talked about a couple months ago that, that Peter started to doubt himself while walking on water in Matthew chapter 14. He didn't doubt Jesus because if he doubted Jesus, he wouldn't have gotten out of the boat. He, he starts to doubt himself and he starts to sink. You Go read the chapter again, Matthew 14. Matthew 15, uh, he doesn't understand the parable of the four soils. So Jesus tells this parable and, and the crowd's like, And then Peter's in private like, yo, tell me what that means. We don't understand. We acted like we understood, but we don't understand. And thank God Peter did that because all of us would read that story today and we'd be like, preach, pastor. Let's go preaching. And then on our ride home, we'd be like, oh, what's that mean? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Peter asked, and then Jesus tells us what it means. So the only reason why we know what it means, the only reason why people preach it is because Peter asked. Humanity is humanity. That was in Matthew 15. In Matthew 16, <laughs> Jesus is warning these disciples about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so they start talking about bread. This is like one of the funniest passages of Scripture. They're like, did you bring the bread? I didn't bring the bread. Jesus is talking about yeast. Did you bring the bread? I didn't bring the bread. We talking about bread? Practice? We talking about practice? We talking about bread? We talking about bread in here? He thinks Jesus is talking about bread and is a figure of speech to talk about the law. Matthew 16, his humanity. Talking about bread? Uh, he argues with the other disciples three times over who is the greatest. Three times. Three times over who is the greatest. And I love that. Because we do it too. We might not say it. I say this to my wife all the time. Am I a good husband? Sure. And then three hours later, am I a good husband? I'm needy, y'all. Am I the greatest? Am I the greatest husband you ever had? She only had one. I think. I hope. The greatest. And, and, and even in this moment, Jesus gets involved in this moment, and he doesn't have a problem with their desire to be great. He just simply said that their greatness or what they thought greatness was was misapplied, and he shows them what true greatness is, and he washes their feet. Crazy. Jesus never rebukes his disciples for their desires. He simply just shows them that they might be misplaced. Talk about honor. Because my kids will come to me with crazy desires, y'all, and I rebuke them for it. They don't know better. Man, this is a rough week, y'all. Fall break, somebody send me some school. Okay, let's talk about Peter's failures because he's got a lot of them. You ready? I'm just going to rip right through these, okay? Peter failed a lot, thank God. Uh, Peter tries to keep children and babies away from Jesus in Mark chapter 10. You ever been in a church where like a pastor will into the mic be like, tell somebody to shut their baby up? <laughs> yeah, if you haven't been in that type of a setting, thank God, but they exist still to this day. Uh, if your baby is crying, I can power through it. I got three of my own. You good? You can keep your babies in here. We got a really good children's ministry though. Peter gets confronted, Mark chapter 10, I love it. Jesus is like, what? I came for the babies, y'all. I came for the babies. Uh, he wants to build Moses and Elijah a shelter on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. First of all, he wakes up and he's like, there's three, there's three dudes. 
Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. Think about how bizarre that would have been. Like, we would have all been like, Peter was on some peyote right here watching this. Like, what's going on here? (laughs) And I love that, that Peter adds to the conversation. Nobody was including Peter in this conversation. He just woke up and thought, oh, I got a suggestion. I'm gonna blood it out. Hey, we should build all three of these people a shelter to worship. Come on, you've been in a room and you talk when you shouldn't be talking. <laughs> and God doesn't confront him for his idea of worship. He just says, yo, just listen to the son. Just listen to my son. In other words, so, so many times in church, where we got people arguing over things they think are biblical but aren't Christ-like. Listen to the son. Just listen to the son. Um, he is called Satan by Jesus. You didn't laugh or snicker or smile at all. He gets called Satan. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You, you Peter, Satan. Who's Satan? Peter, Peter, no, he's Y'all, we did a, a, a series. I don't know. Some of y'all listen to our podcast. Some of y'all don't. We did a four-week podcast called Who is the Devil? And it will blow your mind if you've never thought about this idea. The devil isn't an entity, just so you know. The devil is a spirit of antichrist. And any one of us, including myself, when we are not living with honor and not living with love, are living in a spirit of anti. Christ are operating with a spirit of accusation. When you're operating in a spirit of accusation, you're operating in the Satan, the Greek word. So when Jesus is confronting Peter about the law, he says, get behind me, Satan, because Peter was acting in a spirit of accusation. It's it's amazing when you start to read the scriptures through the lens of Jesus to understand what is acting and what is actually going on. Notice that Jesus did not condemn Peter. He did not reject Peter. He did not demote Peter. He confronted, but still out of love. And there was a relationship here, by the way. Don't go around calling people Satan. And don't ever tell your wife or husband that. Uh, He resists Jesus. Uh, He resists letting Jesus wash his feet in in John chapter 13. He's like, y'all, you ain't touching these bad boys. These puppies are barking by themselves. And Jesus says, uh, you have no part of me if you don't let me serve you. Do you know how provocative that is, y'all? Some of y'all are in church. You've been in church your whole life, and you think that serving is an act of worship, and I would agree with you. So then what is Jesus doing here to humanity? Peter falls asleep three times while he's supposed to be watching out in the Garden of Eden, or not in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26. Three times, y'all. She's like, yo, I'm about to get arrested. He warns them. Hey, can y'all stay up and keep watch? Comes back once, dude's asleep. Wake up, Peter. Keep watch. Comes back two times. Peter's asleep. Wake up, Peter. Comes back three times. Peter's asleep. Peter has something for threes, you know. Three times. He denies Jesus three times, John 18, 18. He denies Jesus three times. Y'all know that story, even if you haven't been in church. I'm gonna come back to that story. It's a good one. He's uh, driven by guilt so much from his denial, which Jesus predicted, that he actually quits the apostolic team in John chapter 21. And what does Peter go back and do? He goes back to the family business to fish. We do do realize that, that, that Peter failed, First of all, he's in so much shame and condemnation and guilt by himself, by his own doing. I failed Jesus, so I'm going to beat myself up. He doesn't even show up at the resurrection, or he doesn't even show up at the crucifixion. Y'all know that. He is in a pity party of his own shame, and he doesn't even go to the one event he should have been at. So much so, he quits and goes back to what he's familiar with. Man, I I do this all the time. I do this weekly. He goes back to fishing. And what's so cool about this uh, passage of scripture, I think it's in uh, John chapter 21. It, it tells us that when he sees Jesus, he put on clothes to jump into the water. All right, I'm just going to drop that and let you think about that. In uh, Acts chapter 5, here's some controversy. Uh, people in the grace stream really get confused by Acts chapter 5 because Acts chapter 5 is that story where Ananias and Sapphira uh, lie and then they end up dead, and people think that God killed them, even though the scripture doesn't say that. There's actually um, 
a lot of scholars that believe it was Peter that killed him, which is ironic that Peter, I, I'm in that, in that camp. I believe that it was Peter that killed Ananias and Sapphira because uh, it said that fear spread between the village about the apostles. Why? Wow, because it makes sense that he killed him. Um, and there's like a whole lot of rituals that had to happen within the, the burial process within Jews that they skip, which they wouldn't have skipped if someone didn't kill him that was trying to get away with murder. Paul confronts him in Galatians chapter 2.11 because he withdrew from the Gentiles when the Jews came along. See, Peter was all about preaching grace to the Gentiles until there were Jews present, and then he got a little scared and started acting like Jews so that the Gentiles wouldn't feel accepted, and Paul comes on the scene, and he confronts him. I love it. There's a lot of failures that Peter has, and I think that we honor him because we know that he came back. But would we be able to honor him in, in these moments where we witnessed him failing? I don't, I don't know that I would. That's why we're talking about this, because we all have people in our lives that are failing us currently. I got these people. And these are the types of people that I think about when I talk about honor. It's like, can, can I honor that dude who's in my life? And I'm like, nah, he's an idiot. He's causing so much chaos in our lives. Does he know what he's doing? He's so far gone. He's going to need a miracle. Man, Jesus needs to show up in the flesh for him. Y'all got these people? I got these people. I put my head down because I'm still, the shame that I feel right now is my own doing. It's not from God, but it's like, I genuinely don't believe that he can change. Like, that's where I'm at currently right now. And I'd be lying to you if I believed that he could. That, that, that person's hard for me to love in, in my life because it's just like abuse after abuse after abuse, taking advantage after taking advantage after taking advantage. He needs help. He's not willing to go get it. He's too far gone. What, what's going on? Can we just build a boundary up from this person and just cut them off completely from our lives because I'm done with being taken advantage of, even though it's not even really me who's taken advantage of. It's family members who's taken advantage of. And then it's like, well, geez, what's going on? And then I'm prepping a sermon like this, and the whole time I'm thinking about that dude. It's like, dang, that guy? Do I have to honor that guy? I put a boundary up. I put a wall up, y'all. I don't want to climb that wall to get to him. You see, how, you see how hard this is? Because we look at Peter and we give Peter the benefit of the doubt because he came back. Which is beautiful about how Jesus viewed Peter. Because he could confront him, but he also believed in him. In fact, he spoke things over Peter that were so important to the story of Peter that you and I can, can, can be really challenged by. And first, at first uh, when Jesus meets Peter, he changes his name from Simon to Peter. He spoke something prophetic over this dude's life because Simon means a, a wavering reed or sand-like, which makes sense when you look at Peter's failures, that he was acting like a, a wavering reed or sand-like. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to call you Peter. And Peter means the rock. And, and, and I'm going to build the church upon the rock. It's Peter who stands up on Pentecost after he betrayed Jesus, after he denied Jesus. And he preaches and 3,000 people are added to the church that day, that Peter, who, who Jesus actually built the church upon. The redemption the glory. Like it's easy to honor Peter because we have that version of Peter after his failures. But can we honor Peter in the midst of his failures? Because that's, that's really, really hard to do. In, in fact, in, in Luke chapter 22, when Jesus is confronting Peter that he's about to deny him three times, he, he uses a specific word that I think can really motivate all of us in this room. In, in Luke 22 verses 31, throw that up there for me. Uh, Jesus is talking to Simon Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, which again, we unpack this in who is the devil? Who is Satan in this specific category? I believe it's Caiaphas who, okay. Um, verse 32, here's the challenge. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail and win. A and win. Maybe the greatest statement you could hear this morning is and when when we talk to people who are not living the way that we would expect them to. 
Jesus did not use the word if. He used the word when. Not if you turn back, strengthen your brothers. When. I wonder if I could, because I can't right now in this moment, is I can't speak to this guy in win language, but I need to, even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, because Jesus is the redeemer, and he already redeemed him. And when you turn back. I believe it was that statement that was probably in Peter's mind the whole time after he denied Jesus. Jesus said when. He didn't say if. He said when. He said, he said, when I, I can, I can overcome this. He said, when he said, when, and, and I love this. This is what, this is where I believe Jesus was reminded of the win. Okay. And, and I'm going to close Tim, Come help me close. We, we preached this before, but it's so profound and it's so amazing. There's certain aspects of the scripture that are so important to understand that can bring us a revelation of actual God's grace and redemption in our lives. John chapter 21, verse 9. Peter's fishing naked. That's so funny to me. And he puts on clothes to jump into the water to swim to Jesus. This is after the resurrection. Jesus is about to redeem a moment with Peter. And in John chapter 29, or 21, verse 9, it says, And when they landed, the disciples, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Hold that scripture up there for a second. So these dudes are fishing for fish, <laughs> and they, they jump to the shore, and Jesus is already preparing fish for them. Crazy. Blows my mind. But there's details in this story that we oftentimes overread that, that we might miss redemption. He saw a fire of burning coals. Do you know that in the scripture, burning coal fire is only mentioned two times? This is one of them. Come on, where are all my, uh, my chefs out there? Some of y'all have been smoking things all week, waiting for this Detroit Lions versus Dallas Cowboys game today at 425. <sighs> Who just spoke that blasphemy? She said, go Cowboys, and I said, go Lions. Anyways, beyond the point, come on. Yeah, I honor you. Even though I know you're a Chiefs fan, Alicia, I know you're a Chiefs fan. You're talking Cowboys. What is this? You just... <sighs> I love, I love y'all so much. I love everybody. Not really, but sometimes. <laughs> Where am I going? Oh, burning coals. Okay, come on. The power of our senses, right? You hear something and it takes you back to something that's either traumatic or good, right? You see something and it brings back emotions, either good or bad. You smell something and it brings back emotions, either good or bad. You, you smell that perfume that you haven't smelled in 20 years, and it takes, take, takes you back. The, the power of our senses, right? The power of smell is so, so important because I believe that Jesus created a fire with charcoal on purpose for this moment because he was about to bring someone's senses back to the moment, bring someone's failure back to the moment, not to shame or condemn them, but to redeem them. Because the first time you hear about somebody sitting by a fire that was burning from Charcoal is found in John 18, 18, the first time that Peter denies Jesus. You better believe that when Peter got to the shore and he sees Jesus cooking on a charcoal fire, he is thinking about the first time he was sitting by a charcoal fire. And he is probably thinking in this moment, dang it. Jesus, why charcoal fire? Because the only time, only thing I'm thinking about right now in this moment is the fact that I betrayed you. Are, you. are you trying to bring this up to remind me of the shame that I'm still living in? Because remember, I quit. I'm fishing. I'm done with all of this. And Jesus in this moment reminds Peter not of his failure to condemn him, but reminds Peter of his redemption and grace and empowers Peter. Peter, remember when I said when, not if. It's this moment, John chapter 21, that gets us to Acts chapter 2, where Peter gets up and preaches, and 3,000 people are at it in a moment. Church, can we be people that don't bring up people's past to shame and condemn them, but, but be redeemers because we have the redeemer within us? Can, can we be people of honor 
where we can honor people in their lived experience and think of them not in a, in a situation of if, but rather when? You say yes, I say yes, but I'm gonna need this reminder on a regular basis because this is hard for me. I hope the rest of this Sunday you are chewing on this idea is who's the person in your life that you need to look at with a win lens, not an if lens. Because your ability to speak win over someone in the midst of their mess could be the redemption that they need to get started doing things the right way. And even if they don't, we still need to be challenged as win people, not if. I'm going to sit with this all week.